Hello, everyone. Um, if anyone is feeling a little tired or attention is flagging, I invite you to stand up or stretch or like move around a little bit. I was getting a little antsy myself over there. It's like, can I? At least I get to stand now. So actually, if you want to stand while I'm talking, that's also totally fine. I heard somewhere sitting is the new smoking. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen that. So, uh, okay, slides are here. I don't know how Cable managed to have his laptop up here and have his slides on the. I'm. I'm a, ah, okay, okay, okay. Um, so I'm talking about uh, imagination and equity because I think those are two of the most important concepts uh, in higher education today. Uh, and equity, usually I think about people who don't have access to education, but there was kind of this ironic moment when I realized that there's four white men uh, sitting up here on stage. And so this question of equity, and then, okay, I'll give the joke away. Someone texted me from the audience and said that we all look the same, just slightly different ages. And I, I fundamentally disagree because I am not wearing a tie. The, the other three are wearing ties. Um, so imagination and equity, I want to thank Alex, I want to thank the um, government of Malta, the permanent secretary, and also the minister. Uh, it's not often that um, you have a minister uh, reference a, a philosopher priest who's a radical critic of uh, institutions in his speech. Uh, usually I try to be provocative. It's going to be hard to be more provocative than that. Um, so I'll talk about a few exciting things that I see uh, happening um, out there on the internet uh, in higher education, most of it happening outside of formal higher education, but I believe relevant to the future of higher education also inside uh, formal education. And I'm going to ask you to suspend a little bit, just for a few uh, minutes, uh, what you kind of have in your head higher education needs to look like. Uh, because a lot of those images, I think, have been created over hundreds of years. Um, and sometimes it's good to just uh, step away from them for a moment and think about higher education. Let allow ourselves to think about higher education in new ways. Um, and that can be hard. Um, so I'll give, if this works, it is the green one, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, are you su switching them or am I switching them? I might have to wave a lot. But uh, so let's imagine a group of students learning. What does that look like? You know, when we all think about our own lives or maybe our professional lives. So my guess would be that for many of us, uh, we imagine something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, there's uh, an uh, older guy uh, standing up there on stage uh, with a book, uh, and there are a bunch of people uh, sitting. Uh, looking and taking notes, um, paying attention, and uh, at least one person, I don't know if you'll spot him, is, all, is asleep. Uh, so some of them are talking to each other in the corner and one, one person is, is asleep. So I think that's a very uh, typical uh, view of higher education um, today. Uh, it was also a very typical view of higher education in the 14th century, and actually it's an image of the University of Bologna, which was founded even uh, hundreds of years before then. So for a thousand years, we've imagined higher education to look like this, even though the format was created because, as Cable pointed out, it was really expensive to make books. So having one person with the book standing up here reading the book made a lot of sense a thousand years ago. It doesn't really make a lot of sense today. But even when technology comes into play, yeah, um, the, these models uh, tend to uh, stick with us. So we add a new technology, but we don't change anything about the format. Um, so educational TV, the expert reading the book to the uh, students, and I'm sure more than one of them uh, is asleep. Um, so uh, let me see where I am here. Yeah, so uh, it's not only that uh, the reasons why these models were created uh, don't exist anymore. We actually have science now that it's not working. 
Um, so this is a slide from, uh, that shows the work of a colleague of mine at the Media Lab, Ros Picard, where she put a bracelet on an MIT student to wear for one week and tracked his electrodermal activity, which is a proxy for engagement. So how engaged was the student? And that could be physical engagement, but also mental engagement. And I don't know if you can see it, but the yellow lines are uh, the uh, students sitting in class, and throughout the entire week, the lowest engagement that the student has is when he is sitting in an MIT class. Um, now, you could say MIT classes must be really bad, uh, and our classes are much better, and um, maybe you're right. Uh, but what's interesting is um, when the student is studying or when he's in the lab, the engagement is much higher. So I think it's... Uh, an interesting um, uh, feedback on how we might want to structure learning uh, in higher education. And so, um, coming back, I actually added two slides into my presentation when the minister was speaking because uh, being German myself, his reference to Bismarck had to be countered with uh, a reference to someone probably who uh, much fewer people are familiar with, Friedrich Fröbel. He is the inventor of the kindergarten. And I think the kindergarten is a much better uh, vision for education, really at all levels, um, and also is the vision for learning and education at the Media Lab, where I work. Um, and we talk about creative learning, um, and the components of creative learning are the four Ps, projects, passion, peers, and play. Uh, and that's how we try to structure the experience for our students, but also in the tools that we design for other people. Um, so back to the... Um, imagination and equity uh, conversation. So I want to propose that open, um, the concept of open could be a way to imagine a more equitable higher education system where we use open as a lens, not a license. And it gives us kind of a design framework for thinking about higher education. I'm going to try to do this um, in, along three dimensions. But um, when we talk about open, uh, I think everyone always has to explain what they mean because it could mean so many different things. And for me, the really fundamental principle within open is participation. I don't think access is enough. I don't think access and invitation to participate is enough. I think real participation has to happen or something is not fundamentally open. And there are many barriers, legal barriers. I think there are technical barriers. There are sociocultural bar barriers that are very difficult to see often. There are financial barriers, opportunity costs. And the way I think about open is it's worth balancing these barriers. Sometimes there will be higher legal barriers. Things may not, not be openly licensed, but the other barriers are very low. And sometimes the other barriers will be higher, but things will be openly licensed. So I think keeping some flexibility in the way that we think about open is useful and also self-serving because some of the examples I give are not openly licensed. Um, so three dimensions. The first one is about open institutions. Um, so I am a huge fan of um, public uh, libraries. Uh, there are over 200,000 public libraries in the world and I think public libraries are the infrastructure for our future education system or at least parts of it. And how did I become so interested in public libraries besides the fact that I loved to read when I was a child? Um, the MOOCs happened, as we all know, and uh, they came out with this incredible um, uh, hope that they would democratize education, and then we saw that that did not happen. They did not reach the people who really needed access to education. And um, for everyone who's actually participated in a MOOC, being thrown into a discussion forum of tens of thousands of other learners can be a very scary experience. It can be a very isolating experience. Um, you do not get a lot of help if you're not already a very sophisticated learner. Um, and so the MOOCs did not really democratize education. They just created an opportunity for people who already had a lot of things going for themselves to learn more and maybe even uh, uh, increase the distance to the others. And so uh, what we thought about, you know, what's a way of, of um, uh, making MOOCs more accessible to people who really need access to education? And um, the thing we came up with was not a new technology or a new tool or better content, but it was a, an old idea. And the idea was that people have always come together at public libraries to read together, to learn together, to talk with each other, to go outside and have a smoke and ask questions and answers. And um, 
the, the communities of learning that you see in these public libraries over hundreds of years, actually, have been very persistent. There's an amazing nurturing environment. And so we went and partnered up with Chicago Public Library and said, hey, what about curating a, a set of online courses and hosting them at the library and having people come together in the safe space of the <coughs> library, supported by the librarians, to take these online courses? And so that's what we did. Um, we brought people together, real people in real places. Um, we chose open content and courses where, wherever we could find them. We often selected MOOCs that were not open because some of the subjects that people were hoping to take were not available, um, openly licensed on the MOOC platforms. And we also gave them certificates at the end, certificates of completion. And these certificates are not accredited. Um, and they're, um, you know, you could say meaningless, but a lot of the people who came through these um, learning circles had either fallen out of education, had lost confidence that they could succeed. And so for them to complete an online course together with a bunch of other people and help the other people as much as get getting help from them was actually an incredible achievement and I think gives them the confidence that allows them to consider re-entering formal education and maybe pursuing a degree at a community college or a university. So we started in Chicago. Um, we're in 10 library systems now. We have two international pilots in Paris and Kenya. And in 2017, we hope to be in 25 library systems, hundreds of libraries, and well-established in those three countries. Um, all of our materials, all of our tools, all of our uh, resources are openly available, CC BY licensed uh, on p2pu.org. Um, so I invite you all to have a look. And uh, if any of this is, is useful or interesting, uh, please come and talk to me. Um, I want to end this section on a note of uh, kind of a little bit of frustration because uh, what I'm seeing now is that courses are disappearing from these MOOC platforms, paywalls are rising, there's more and more an emphasis on certification that costs money, and in fact, remix and reuse is not allowed. So I was really happy to hear from Jeff actually about the um, uh, University of the Third Age, that they're managing to get kind of copies of these courses. Uh, and I would hope that more MOOC providers and universities offering MOOCs make those available to people like Peter P. University um, or the University of the Third Age. Um, because I think this is a worrying trend and especially disappointing because they started with such rhetoric around democratization of education. And now we're look, it's looking more like corporate training. So open institutions, new types of institutions, open communities. And this one's a little puzzling uh, for me. And I should say, um, you saw this slide before. Uh, in a way, I'm a little um, disappointed by what we've been able to achieve in the learning technology space because ultimately a lot of it looks like educational television on small screens. So instead of all of us looking at one television, we are all sitting in the subway and looking at our own little device but completely isolated from each other and still just consuming content other people have created. And I've actually written a paper about this. Um, however, um, I'm really puzzled by what's happening on YouTube. And I think YouTube is a bit of a blind spot for the open education movement, partly because the materials are not openly licensed, most of them. But um, I believe that anything you can learn by sitting in a room and listening to someone speak, you can learn better on YouTube. And this talk is being recorded or streamed, and so I think you would have a better experience next week watching this talk at home with a cup of tea, pausing or going back or going forward if you're bored, then you are having right now, having to listen to me at my speed, how, you know, if I wanna make a silly joke, I'm gonna go and make the joke. So I think anything that can be taught and learned in this setting works better on YouTube than in the real world. Um, there are some exceptions where really we come together kind of as humanity and there's a, a moment of collective, uh, um, collectivism actually, so like something happens when you put a lot of people into a room. So I don't want to take away from those. I think those are very important, but I think most lectures are more like people sitting and listening and they might as well do this on YouTube. And just the mind boggling scale of education that's happening on YouTube and what people are learning. Um, uh, Khan Academy videos, I just went on there yesterday to check the stats. They crossed one billion views now. So. A guy with a, a laptop at home made a bunch of videos for his nephews and uh, it became a one billion view education enterprise in the course of 10 years with three million subscribers, over 6,000 videos. 
And the, in the last two weeks, they give you the stats on YouTube over it, broken in these last two in these two week um, uh, uh, blocks, and uh, 25,000 new subscribers. And then I looked up the education system of Malta, and I believe, and I might be getting the numbers a little bit wrong, but that the primary education system of Malta has about 25,000 students. So the entire primary school system of Malta joined, uh, obviously not joined, but joined Khan Academy online to watch these videos in just the last two weeks. Like, imagine having to build schools and institutions and buying books and hiring teachers. It's amazing what's happening out there. And uh, I'm a little puzzled by it, but uh, I, I feel like we need to pay attention to it. It's also swapping. So the other thing is, um, it's not just math and a bunch of other topics. You find anything on there. I've, I've, I've looked around for a bunch of like, obscure things. Obviously, a lot of practical things, how to repair your bike, how to cook pasta, how to do makeup is uh, very popular on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I did not look at those so much. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, but really, like whatever your field is, I encourage you to go to YouTube and try to find a short video where someone explains a really hard problem in your field. And I'd be surprised if you didn't find dozens uh, that are doing a pretty good job. Um, and it's starting to swap into formal education. So uh, the American uh, uh, Medical Association um, did a survey with 200 surgeons, actually surgeons of plastic surgery, uh, and 64% of them uh, admitted to after having completed their medical degrees, so these are all uh, uh, doctors that have gone to medical school and they've become surgeons, 64% learn new skills on YouTube. Uh, and so I did look at a few of the videos that they referenced and I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> there's a, there, there are a lot of surgery videos on YouTube that you do not wanna, wanna see. Um, so, but for me, YouTube, I think, new communities that are emerging online that are seemingly completely outside of the formal education system are maybe doing more education and maybe doing more learning than many of the projects that we ourselves are trying to launch and we're investing a lot of time and money into. Um, so the last section, last kind of theme I want to talk about is a little bit is open credentials. And the first one is about assessment. And I'm not gonna talk very much about assessment, but I have an opinion on it. And so I, I know there are other s sessions, and so I wanna just, uh, it's a little cheeky, but so I believe that if something can be graded by a computer today, the chance, chances are very uh, high that it, it can be done by a computer tomorrow. So if we think about where the world is headed with artificial intelligence and machine learning and robots, um, if we're, focusing our attention on teaching and assessing things that these machines and robots will be doing very, very soon, I think we're missing the mark. So in the discussion about assessment, I think there are more interesting things to focus on um, that are equally challenging or even, even more challenging, but I, th I feel like it's a good um, kind of a, uh, a way to, to look at the things we're, we're focusing on and see if they're important and if a computer can do them then probably uh, we, we might wanna focus elsewhere. But um, so I don't do a lot of work on assessment. That was just one little slide. Most of my work is around credentials. Uh, so uh, the pieces that you, pieces of evidence or paper that you get after you've been assessed by someone and that uh, attest that you have some achievement or some experience or some skill. And the reality is uh, most of our academic credentials are still largely paper-based or if we have digital version, they're often very paper inspired. They're just paper kind of made digital. Um, the users are fundamentally not in control of their achievement record. What I mean by this is sure, you get the piece of paper, but if you wanna uh, get a job or you wanna prove to someone that you have this piece of paper, that person always has to go back to the institution. The registrar's office gets $7.50 and they, and actually the amazing thing is some of these institutions require you to send a fax. Um, I don't even have, I don't have a fax machine anymore. So you're sending a fax there, maybe with, then you send a check in the mail and then they send a letter somewhere. It's so unsafe, so next point, it's really easy to cheat. Uh, there's a huge amount of degree fraud. Um, and uh, finally, there's a lack of data. Because all these things are happening on paper and in the, in the postal mail, like, there's no um, way of actually seeing what's happening in these systems, what are the degrees that really help you get the job you want, et cetera. So if we, think about academic credentials in the digital space, the first fundamental decision we have to take is, are we talking about a centralized system or a decentralized system? So LinkedIn is the obvious uh, answer if people are thinking about their uh, record of achievement or their professional resume. 
That's where all of our professional resumes are these days. I actually don't have a lot of um, data on, on LinkedIn, but um, I know lots of people do, and it's becoming a very useful tool for people to find a job. But the fundamental um, challenge with LinkedIn is that you don't own your own data anymore. So all the things you put in there about where you went to school and all those recommendations from other people, all of that content is owned by LinkedIn. And they give you free access to it because they're very nice and they want you to stick around. But they could change that at any moment and they could charge you for it. And once you need LinkedIn to get the next job, chances are they will start charging you for it. And finally, LinkedIn is doing a lot of really interesting data analysis um, and actually, I don't want to bash LinkedIn. I, Reed Hoffman is an uh, advisor of the Media Lab. He's a super nice guy. I think they have a lot of the, the right goals, creating these opportunities for people. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm using them to, to highlight the difference between centralized and decentralized. But LinkedIn is also doing really interesting data analysis. But again, all this data is owned by LinkedIn, and we can't really get at it. We can't look at it. If I'm a government and I want to see a certain career and how I could get people into this career. Like, I don't get to look at the data that LinkedIn has, unfortunately. So centralized versus decentralized. <clears throat> so at the Media Lab, we went ahead and um, we started experimenting with what would a decentralized digital credential system look like. And uh, we prototyped a, a bunch of things and we made something like this um, for our alums uh, and for people who came to a workshop and for our director's fellows. And fundamentally, it's a digital piece of data that has all the same content that the paper has, but it's stored in a decentralized way, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. And by doing this on an on a, um, on a infrastructure called the blockchain, you enable uh, a decentralized verification. So other people can verify your degrees without having to go back to MIT. I can show someone here that I'm an alum of MIT, which I'm not, but um, then you could verify that that's my statement is true or false simply by looking at the data I'm providing to you and verifying it using this open uh, infrastructure called the blockchain. And what's the technology underneath this? It's really two pieces. One is the Mozilla, op or it's not now just called Open Badges, um, but it was started by Mozilla. It's a data specification for credentials, essentially. So it gives you all the fields that you need to fill out when you want to make a digital credential. And something called the blockchain. Um, and just to check how many people here are familiar with the blockchain or have heard of the blockchain. Okay, so about a third. Um, I won't go into detail, but you can imagine it as a decentralized ledger, like a spreadsheet that lives on thousands of computers they all negotiate with each other, and anyone, all of us, can write more data into this ledger, and whatever we've written in, into it can never be changed or deleted. Um, so that's a very simple, s simplified explanation of it, but it highlights why it's useful for academic records. We can all write data into the blockchain, store the data there, notarize uh, academic credentials, and put the, the information to notarize them onto the blockchain, and then anyone in the future can refer back to this uh, uh, information that we've put there um, and uh, use it to verify the credentials we're sharing with them. And also, there's a session by Chris um, and Dan from Learning Machine, and I'll actually I'll come to you guys in a second, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I think, where I'm sure they'll talk more about kind of the inner workings of how all of this works. So, um, so after the first prototype, we started collaborating with a company called Learning Machine and really build out a set of open source tools that let anyone do this. So there's an, a tool to issue these credentials, there's a tool to verify these credentials, there's a wallet that you can download into your phone and receive the credentials and share them with other people. And it's all very well documented, high quality open source code. It's MIT licensed, which means you can do whatever you want with it, even for commercial purposes. And we're really hoping to build a community of people and institutions around this uh, code and standard who can help us evolve it and kind of design the next iterations and also build more applications on top of it. So what does digital credentials enable? Well, all the problems with paper credentials are potentially solvable. Of course, it's always much harder than, um, than you can put on a slide with uh, six sentences. But users can be in control of their achievement records and data. Um, you can have decentralized verification and trust. You can use the data that's being generated to inform public and private policy making. Um, and it can be governed by a community of higher education institutions in an open way, 
which means these institutions and lots of other participants, other participants can make design decisions about what should be in the standard and what should be out of the standards together. Um, and it's early days, this is the time to experiment. There's still lots of huge questions that are interesting to work on, both on the research side and on the kind of prototyping side. And so I, I, I really hope that lots of you will go to this session by Learning Machine, and also this afternoon we'll talk a little bit about it in the accreditation section, session. So tying all of this up, when we look through this lens of open, and across these different dimensions, and we imagine a new university, I think fundamentally one of the important things is it has to be a public university because I see the trend in the US towards privatization of higher education, and I believe the externalities of higher education are, are such that you can never fully capture them through a market-based approach. So it's too important for countries, it's too important for economies for, to have higher, high quality higher education than to let the market decide it and let the private companies take it over. The public in, in higher education is extremely important. And then coming back to this lack of imagination or this imagination. So um, I don't know if you've ever been at a conference where people were discussing the future of higher education and uh, they were talking about, oh, if only we had a new institution. And so I've been to a few of those and I always at some point there someone says, well, we would like to create the Harvard of and then you fill in whatever country you're in. The Harvard of Germany, the Harvard of France, the Harvard of Italy. And um, I, I just typed in the Harvard of Africa and there's almost 6,000 results on Google where people are trying to create or talking about the Harvard of Africa. And it puzzles me because why are we so obsessed with these elite universities from the US? So the, 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 the thing that's wrong with these institutions, and I work at an institution that's like this, but um, the, the thing that's wrong with our institutions is that we compete on how many people we can exclude. And so in the New York Times on the uh, 30th of March uh, last year, there's an article, College Admiss Admissions Shocker, and it announced that Stanford, after having had a, a very low rate in the year before, in 2016 they decided to accept 0% of their applicants. And they were doing this because if they accepted 0%, they would automatically be the most desirable school of all the schools in the US. So it's harder to get into Stanford than MIT or Carnegie Mellon or Princeton or any of these other schools. So they're gonna accept zero students. And then there's a great quote there that says, in the stack of applications that we reviewed, we didn't see any gold medalists from the last Olympics, summer or winter, and while there was a 17-year-old who'd performed surgery, it wasn't open heart or a transplant or anything like that. She'll thrive at Yale. Um, and so, <laughs> so, so of course, this was a, a April Fool's, but the reality is not, as always with good um, humor, the reality is, is, is very close. Stanford only accepts 5% of students, and, and all of these universities do. And a lot of the people that get accepted already come from a very high socioeconomic status. And also keep in mind, 5% of an incredibly well-qualified 100% that apply. I mean, these are the most qualified students that apply, and they only take 5%. And so Stanford accepts only 5%, and California State fails 83%. The problem is not just at the top, it's also at the bottom. And bottom is the wrong word here, but California State was created to be a public university where anyone who was qualified to study could come and get a, a higher education degree. And their graduation rate, four-year completion rate, is 17%. So 83%, Cal State is unable to help them graduate. So we're failing students at the, at the lower end, and we're definitely failing students at the higher end. So US public education is failing at the top and the bottom. At the same time, there's this incredible push in what, what started as this um, really hopeful, I think, movement around MOOCs and digital education, where I think MOOCs today are much more market-driven, occasional online courses. It's where people have to pay money to get in, they have to pay money for certification, they, they don't really run all the time, so if you miss the, the course, sometimes you can't get into the next one. And um, I see this at MIT, there's a real interest in um, monetizing digital education opportunities, and there is a huge opportunity for institutions like MIT, but it's, it's, it's at the expense of true public universities. So I think 
there's an opportunity for a European approach. Because Europe does have a huge advantage over the US, and that is the belief and support for public funding for education here is still much stronger. I know all of your institutions, you're worried about this, and maybe it's changing, but it is still much better than in the US. And I think that creates an opportunity to be very innovative and be leaders in this space. And so my suggestion to you is, Imagining equitable higher education through the lens of open, looking at institutions, at communities and credentials, building on the great tradition of European public education. Thank you very much. That's my contact if any of you want to talk more. Or...